and uh, we started tracking some of her story down. So what was happening is she was giving them a statement. This is happening. That's happening. This is the guy who's involved. Darren Fitzgerald is in the house also. And then the rest of us would start running down all the leads so that we could corroborate everything she was saying. And uh, it went fairly smooth. At one point, we found out that the car that Anna Marie was killed in, they had sold, um, you know, it was a used car. They sold to some car dealer, uh, you know, a street corner, you know, a small lot mm -hmm. in Belmar. Oh, wow. and, uh, yeah, and by the time, by the time we started getting all this story and things from Teresa Smith, it was getting later and later in the afternoon on Friday. So I'm, I'm thinking it might have been five or six o'clock and the guy might have been closed uh, when we drove down there. So uh, myself and uh, I, I'm trying to remember who it was, but one of the county guys, um, we drove down there, got a hold of the police department guys in Belmar, and uh, they contacted the guy and had him come back to the dealership. And then we, we knew from doing a reverse lookup on the car, we knew what the VIN number was and all that. So we uh, talked to him. He gave us the name of this nice lady he sold the car to. And uh, she was actually living in, I'm going to say Avon, Avon by the sea, down there along, across the bridge from Belmar. And uh, so we went over there and I introduced myself, obviously, and I said, listen, we have reason to believe that the car you bought may have been used in a crime. Please don't get upset. But could we have your permission to look at it? And she said, oh, absolutely. I don't, oh, my God, if something happened. I said, well, I don't want to go into too much uh, of the details, however. So we went and got in the car. And sure, as the sun comes up, there were holes in the headliner on the passenger side of the car and what looked to me to be bloodstains. And I said, oh, I just can't. They sure didn't detail this car too much, but there was uh, there was small holes and that may have explained uh, exactly how that car was used. And then down along the side of the seat. One, one, one quick question. You said small holes as if, as if uh, bullet holes? Yeah. As if maybe she was killed, what, shot while in the trunk. Yeah. She was, uh, I think she was shot right in the front seat of the car. Oh, the front and, seat. And there was blood splatter uh, up there in the upper, you know, right hand side of the car on the passenger side. And uh, then we looked down into the seat, the front seat. And you could see that there was some uh, blood stains down in the carpet and the cushion of the seat itself. So then uh, it uh, obviously we were going to seize the car. Um, so I went back and had a conversation with the lady and I said, listen, I really can't go into a lot of detail because we also, Megan Mold and Fitzgerald were out and about loose. We didn't want to anybody getting nervous and, you know, speaking out of turn and telling them that we were coming for them. So uh, we, uh, I explained the situation, just told her it was a serious crime. We'd need to seize the car. We'd certainly give her a receipt for it and things like that. And she says, you know, it's a shame. It was a good car. It actually ran pretty well. And I said, listen, do you mind if I use your phone? Of course, this was before cell phones. And um, I, you, I called my headquarters, Ocean Township, and got Al Lair on the phone. Now, if I just anecdotally, Al Lair, when he became prosecutor, started a narcotic strike force in 1979. And it's actually still operating to this day. 
I was one of the first officers that was assigned to that. Um, to his uh, unit and so he and I not only knew each other I worked with him on a lot of cases and I also did a lot of the evidence when we do narcotics raids and things like that so he knew I knew how to cross my t's and dot my i's he said uh, listen what's the deal I said Al we got to take the car I know that and it's got evidentiary value no doubt about it i said i just feel you know bad can we help this lady somehow i mean this was her only means of, he says i'll tell you what buy the car from her <laughs> i said <laughs> what he says buy it i said well yeah because if we buy it then it's yours and i bet you you'll give me permission to conduct a search on it i said <laughs> that kind of sews it up pretty neatly yeah. so um that's what i did I asked, you know, I, I knew how much she paid for it. And we made sure that she had a little something to maybe rent a car for a couple of days and then get a check from the county for the car. So that was done. Actually, she signed the title over while I was there and I bought it back with me along with the car. And we bought the car back and put it in our Sally port in the police headquarters and started going over it with a fine tooth comb. And uh, that took us right up to the point where we were just about ready to go and uh, execute a search warrant on Begenwald's house, arrest him, arrest Fitzgerald, because the story we got, he was involved in this. Uh, we knew about that they had a secret room in there um, and that there was a lot of other weapons and things. So... We worked well into the night and it was uh, probably two, three o'clock in the morning when we finally ended up executing that warrant. We had everything organized in teams. Um, I was not only going to do the search and thing, but I was one of the, myself, Ken Kennedy, who played the part of a, uh, uh, a criminal who was breaking in a bag of walls car. That's how we lured him out of the house. Uh, Mike Dowling, John Kula, we were all part of like the arrest team. So when we got a hold of Begenwald, we were going to pounce on him and drag him down and, and take him away from the house, which happened. And uh, that went off without a hitch, thank God, because once we got into the, his house and also into Fitzgerald's, Fitzgerald was nowhere to be seen and his girlfriend said he left. But we had been kind of sitting on the place for a bit, so we didn't see anybody leave. And uh, we knew about this secret room. And myself and a couple of other people had gone into the house because uh, Beganwald had been taken away uh, by John Kula, drove him down to Asbury headquarters, uh, and Gary Weary, who was the detective captain from Asbury. We leaning up against the wall that adjoined this room that was secreted with a full length mirror. Uh, I could hear something and other people could uh, inside. So we made some uh, uh, exclamatory statements about what might happen if he didn't give up. And uh, after a couple of seconds, he said, I give up, forget it. And he started opening the mirror, we grabbed it and grabbed him by the arms and pulled him out. He was in that room for a while, probably 15, 20 minutes, with a loaded uh, rifle in there. So he could have done an awful lot of damage to us. Um, I don't know if you want me to just keep on rolling, or, but we found out about uh, 
Begenwald had actually cut a hole in the floor of the living room of the apartment he was using and put a bedroom down in the basement. And he had a, you know, a makeshift staircase. And down there was him, his wife's and wife's bedroom, uh, a jewelry box and the other ring that was missing from Anna Maria Lesowitz was sitting on the uh, in the jewelry box on the table, and also down in his bedroom was a uh, aquarium with a puff adder snake in it. And a puff adder is one of the most venomous snakes in the world. They were milking the uh, venom from the puff adder, and. Um, there were other chemicals around. And because I taught narcotics at the police academy, because I went to DEA school and all those things when I worked undercover in narcotics, um, they had DMSO, which is dimethyl sulfoxide. And anything you mix with it will absorb through the skin. And I found a notebook later that spoke of the snake venom, DMSO, and payphones. And apparently, these guys were going to paint earpieces on payphones with the snake venom, with the DMSO. And I'm going to guess, watch people keel over because the venom is very fast acting and very deadly. So some of the things were just, I mean, it was, I spent 13 hours in that house searching it. And that was both of their apartments. And we used our heads because uh, it was good police procedure. I was the only one who touched evidence. And the reason being, you don't want to end up with, you know, for God's sake, what happened with OJ and that six different people getting up and saying, oh, no, I picked up the glove. No, I did. Oh, no, and the glove don't fit. No, please. So we always did it when I worked on loan at the prosecutor's office the same way. Um, we, one person handled the evidence. People can help search, but they don't touch anything. If they see something, they come and tell you and you go and, and you know, uh, properly log it, tag it and bag it and things like that. The murder weapon that Anna Marie was killed with was a Beretta Minx. 22 short uh, auto loading pistol. The thing that was important about that is that thing would only chamber a 22 short round. And if you remember, I mean, I know you do, but maybe the people who are listening or watching, the uh, 22 shorts were very popular in uh, what they called gallery guns. You know, you go down to the boardwalk in the days when they let you actually shoot something real. Mm -hmm. um, and those, you know, not a high powered round at all, doesn't make a hell of a lot of racket, uh, but is very functional. So um, what we did, the, the, the uh, gun and another 22, Harriet Richardson, I think it was, were wrapped up in a towel that stunk a cleaning fluid underneath Fitzgerald's bed. And he seemed, looking around, he seemed like he was to tidy her upper or make sure this has got oil on it, that kind of thing. So the weapon was found there. Later on in the trial, the people, the guys before the uh, we testified in front of the judge and jury were saying, Oh, this is a problem, you know, the gun was, and they're going to say Fitzgerald did it, you know, and it wasn't Begenwald, even though we had, you know, a lot of information about that. And uh, when they were talking about it, the morning I happened to be coming to testify, I said, well, wait a minute. He had the gun. He didn't have any ammo. And I said, well, he had, he had lots of ammo. I said, he had plenty of 22 long, long rifle some 22 Magnums, they were making those little guns out of lighters, the Bic lighter guns. 
which I'm sure you have uh, photos of and things. Yeah. Um, and, uh, oh, look what we got. <laughs> um, there it is. They, uh, the 22 shorts, though, nobody had, except they were in Begenwald's bedroom right behind it, the headboard of his, uh, of his bed. So, and he had a board in his bedroom area that he must have been practicing with that weapon because it had uh, all sorts of bullet holes in it. And mm -hmm. in the video from the trial that you have some of, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see actually me pulling the board out of the crawl space because it had like a, what I call a Yankee basement, part of it's deep enough and the other parts like crawl space. Um, there was a big board in there with very many 22 rounds shot into the board for, I guess, target practice. Um, but as I said, he was the only one who had the ammo and actually his wife uh, turned out to be the one that was purchasing the ammo from Bob Kislin's, which was a sporting goods store that was in Ocean Township. Fitzgerald did buy some ammo uh, and back then you just needed the, your driver's license to buy ammo in New Jersey. Uh, and embarrassingly enough for the poor clerk from Kislin's when he testified, uh, Fitzgerald's driver's license address was Trenton State Prison. Um, not with the words Trenton State Prison on it, but his address and his driver's license said, Drawer C building something, Trenton, New Jersey. And uh, yeah, they, they told him, you know, that's the uh, Trenton State Prison. Well, as we went through the house, we saw more and more chloral hydrate, which are like knockout drops. And apparently Diane Baganwald worked at the pharmacy in Ocean Township and I don't know how many things she was either stealing or somebody was getting and they had like a stockpile of that stuff. Plus they had uh, a bunch of remote control servos for model airplanes. And I'm kind of a, like a tech guy. So I saw things I said, oh yeah, that's where, I said, wait a minute, there's no airplanes around here. You know, the, I mean, I wonder what they're doing. And lo and behold, in one of the closets in their kitchen, we find a whole pile of pipe bombs, mm. uh, some other explosive devices. And in that notebook that I mentioned that had some uh, references to uh, a lot of other things, including the snake venom, there were hand-drawn maps to uh, politicians and actually Chief Justice uh, Willens at that time uh, of the New Jersey Supreme Court, had a home in Deal, New Jersey, which isn't that far, what, two towns away from Asbury Park. Um, they had maps to his house. And I'm thinking, God knows what, I mean, I thank God every day that all this stuff came out. It was a miracle in a week. You know, we went from we're not sure what we're going to have to talk to a lot of different people. We got to start retracing this poor girl's steps. And it went from that to this kind of on a silver platter. And he had everything he needed to make mayhem in, uh, in a lot of different places. So we had to bomb people from Fort Monmouth and uh, maybe the Navy uh, come out and they actually took the bombs uh, out out to Sandy Hook and detonated them because there's no way you can't unscrew a pipe bomb it'll blow you up. How um, many how many uh, do you think there were? I'm gonna say 15 because that's the number that's just jumping in my head. I'll be honest, John, one of the things I didn't do, Obviously, I made the return on the search warrant, you know, the uh, inventory for the return to the judge on the search warrant. The search warrant actually was drawn up by Billy Lucia. 
So I gave him um, the, uh, the inventory. I never made a copy of it. And it wasn't to me at that time important because everything was going, you know, in the same place out at the prosecutor's office wall. But afterwards I say, gee, you know what? I should have saved that because I always wondered some of the items that we talked about. There was a audio tape in there of them talking to Begenwald's father. And it almost sounded like, he, I know he was very ill, almost like nursing home care. And he stayed with them in the Asbury Park for a while. And it almost sounded like, I don't know if they were, I'm not gonna say torture, but they were certainly goading him uh, in the thing. So, uh, and there were other conversations on the tape and Al Lair and I sat down there for and listened to a little bit of it. And he said, seize that, make sure it can't be erased. And uh, I'm gonna be, you know, listening to that later. But as it turned out, once we got everybody down to uh, Asbury's headquarters, now we find out through the preponderance of evidence that Anna Marie was actually killed in Asbury. They drove her over to Ocean to dump her body. They tried to dig a hole in that field that I mentioned behind Burger King, but because that motel was still under there, that's what kept them from digging a hole. And I'll be honest, if they had been able to dig a hole, we might still be wondering what happened to poor Anna Maria Lessman. Um, mm -hmm. It just, like I said, everything happens for a reason. It sure did in this case. Mm -hmm. And um, we obviously, after, after that, it was basically Asbury's murder case. The county was involved with them with it. Um, we went back and did our processing back in Ocean, you know, report writing and everything like that. But at that point, there was no reason for me to keep involved. I knew there were other victims they were talking about. And that's why it was so important to document all those things about um, the weapons and things, because Fitzgerald had a lot of weapons with silencers in them, on them that they were homemade silencers. And they, there was a murder of Billy Ward, which I testified in two trials. The first one was Anna Maria Lesowitz, and that's depicted in the picture in the background here um, where I'm going over the map of the house. Um, and then Billy Ward was the next case and they got a venue change. So we went down to Mount Holly to uh, do that case. But uh, other than myself, there weren't a lot of other people testifying because everything was pretty much sewn up with statements. You know, I mean, we had all the players and Fitzgerald had uh, rolled over at that point.